I'm delighted to welcome Narcis to the channel today. Narcis is a serial startup investor, an entrepreneur, and a growth specialist. We've got lots of really good information for startup companies today from Narcis. He's going to go into the biggest mistakes you make, what you need to prepare if you're looking for investment, and a whole host of other information. So stick around, go to business-questions.com to see the, the full interview, which is for members only, and we hope you enjoy it. It's great to see you here, Narcis. The first question I'd like to ask you um, concerns startups. I know that you've got an interest in, in six startups you're helping at the moment, and you've actually invested in, in two of those. But what qualities are you looking for in a startup, and what qualities gives them the best chance of actually succeeding? Thanks for having me here first. But uh, secondly, um, I think, I mean, I know that uh, a business is made of people. So uh, the, the most important quality is actually uh, uh, making sure that the, the team, the creative team, the founders, the entrepreneurs that are creating the business are uh, the right fit for me <laughs> and I'm the right fit for them. So it's a, it has to be a mutual two-way stream on this. And uh, the reason for that is because we are... Uh, I believe that the product is not good unless it's uh, uh, backed up by a very, very, very uh, focused entrepreneur behind. And, and that is where I um, make my choice to say, if you, I can help you achieve the focus, but uh, you need to be um, basically comp compatible with myself as well as a way of working as a way of thinking as a way of uh, of, of running a business um, so for me team is the most important thing but the other thing also very important is um, do you have a real USP because a lot of uh, a lot of people that I talk to in the world of business they started uh, out of uh, uh, sometimes by mistake uh, uh, they came up with something that uh, it was uh, without thinking about it much and so I always say that in business you have to have a lot of luck as well um, I've been also on the other side of the fence which is uh, 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 having a business that uh, that was a flop and you had to move away from it so i know and i always say you learn more from failure than you uh, than you learn from successes uh, which is so important so i guess for for me then the person that is the entrepreneur has to be aware that the failure will always be there and they have to be uh, happy to embrace first the risk because there is always a risk when you go in business. And secondly, uh, to learn from their own failures. And that failure doesn't mean that you are not good enough. Failure can mean that you actually have to, it's part of the journey. And you have to enjoy that journey as much as you uh, enjoy the destination. So back to the first, to your question, the, the team, um, the, the personality is so important. The the, the USP of the product or of, of the idea. And uh, the third thing I would say uh, is the, the drive. What is the personal drive behind making that happen? And in business world, you can call it the vision, you can call it uh, uh, your, uh, your values, you can call it uh, your uh, um, uh, guiding principles. A lot of people call it different things, but I come back to the same thing with What's your drive? And if you are clear about that, then it's messaged correctly towards your audience. That makes the difference between being a success or a flop. And you mentioned your, um, your, your failures. What did you learn from those failures? What have you taken forward from that that you can now implement into your, your new businesses? So precisely that, because um, uh, I come back to the team. Uh, the failure, uh, the biggest failure in business for me it was not related to the process or the product. It was related to the, 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 the business partners that I was with. And that, uh, that's why it's, uh, I came back, I came, I'm coming back to my conclusion that uh, choosing the right partners uh, is the most important thing in business. And you have to take enough time to know each other and to understand very well what drives you, what doesn't, and what works and what doesn't work between each other. And then you can make it a success. And if you come across uh, an entrepreneur having a, a startup, 
who's perhaps come from a large corporate culture previously. Do you find it easier to work with them or are they more constrained um, in their, their thought trade as opposed to someone who's perhaps run a, a small business before but has had a great new idea and they they want to take that to market? Is there, they've obviously got pros and, and cons, but is, is there anything that restricts someone who's come from the corporate background? I always say that uh, the sky is the limit and you are your own enemy. Uh, so uh, it doesn't really matter. I did corporate as much as I did uh, small uh, SMEs and I've been part of the, I've been part of organizations that were uh, turning over a million pounds and I was part of organizations that were turning over billions and billions. So, uh, so I can understand the different concepts and things that you learn from each organization. However, when you go into a startup, uh, you go with it. Again, I come back to the drive. What drives you to do that? And if you were in the corporate world all your life and you only know uh, uh, structure and process uh, uh, and very uh, tidy uh, way of doing, that can actually be a, an asset for a startup because you need process and structure in order to become successful. However, um, you need to know your limitations and you need to know what you are good at and what you're not good at. So I would say that if you come from the corporate world and that's what you did all your life, uh, that means you're going to be a very good process uh, uh, mapper and you're going to be a very good structure. Uh, 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 structure. Uh, but then you need to actually partner with somebody that is the opposite, that brings the, the fluffiness that is needed on a, on a startup, the, the enthusiasm, the, the, the thinking out of the box and, uh, and running before you walk, which you don't normally do in corporate because it's the opposite thing that you should do in corporate. You walk first and then you, you run. So the two become then an item. And I always say that one plus one makes three. Uh, because it becomes a much more enhanced solution than uh, than just uh, just you yourself. So I come back to the team. Create your team based on your strengths and also, but also based on your weaknesses. Uh, because there is no point to partner with somebody that is identical to you. You have to partner with somebody that complements you, okay. both on strengths and on weaknesses. So, so team is um, inherently important to a to a startup. Uh, the founders have got together, teams got together, they're looking for finance, they're creating a, a pitch deck. As an investor, are the pitch decks generally containing enough information for you or do they perhaps go into too, too much detail and you actually prefer to see something simpler? What, what, what is the perfect pitch deck um, constitute for you? So I, uh, one of my mottos in, in life and business is uh, KISS. Uh, keep it simple, stupid. Um, however, uh, as you say, you need to have the right balance. Uh, so I've seen uh, uh, investment uh, pitch decks that were uh, two-page uh, uh, solution and it was uh, uh, full packed with a lot of small information, but it was very, very broad and not in, in enough detail. Um, I also have seen uh, uh, pitches that were like 25 slides uh, or 30 slides uh, that you uh, you wanted to cut your veins by the by the end of uh, of it because it was way too much. Um, I believe in balance, so for me, ideal pitch deck should be up not more than 10 slides, uh, but it has to follow a very simple and basic uh, business model: why, what, how, who, how much. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's as simple as you can get. And if you follow that, you won't need more than 10 slides because you don't need more than two slides per each. So it's, because at the end of the day, what an investor wants to see is, do you know your market? Do you know your product? Do you have the right team? Do you have the right uh, uh, credible uh, projections? because you're asking for money. So if I give you my money, I need to, I want to know that you already know and you thought about it very, very clearly what you're going to do with that money. Uh, because that's where responsibility and credibility kicks in. So if that is shown, you can show it in 10 slides as much as in, uh, in, in 30 or 50. You don't need all that. And you can always, you have to remember that, I don't know if you're familiar with Dragon's Den. Yes, yeah, but, of course. Uh, the other, uh, I met uh, one of the guys that, um, um, used to do all the due diligence for the dragons post uh, investment. So you know you have the beauty thing, uh, beautiful thing on TV when they say, "I'm going to invest X amount on your business." But after that, there is a whole process of due diligence to make sure that they don't fail. That so, what people don't know is that ninety percent of the 
investments that are done on the show are are failing at due diligence. Uh, uh, so that tells you a lot about when you go in front of an investor with your pitch deck, you need to have the back uh, uh, covered with all the information uh, that you need to uh, to to secure the investment after it. Uh, somebody says yes. So that's why I'm saying the pitch should not be more than 10 slides. But of course, if you put a, a number in terms of financials, in terms of projections, in terms of ROI, in terms of investment, what you need, all those numbers, they have to come from a very, very uh, pretty much bulletproof uh, uh, financial planning behind and business planning behind, uh, because you need to show that after that. So, uh, so, so what I say, less is more and, and keep it simple. Show less at the beginning, but whatever you show, it has to be really, really documented. And you, 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 um, you mentioned um, Dragon's Den, which actually brings me on quite, quite um, neatly to uh, uh, my next question, which is on Dragon's Den, one of the fatal areas that, that the entrepreneurs make is the overvaluation. And I see this all the time on investment platforms online. We have a startup company who have not even got, uh, they've got an MVP just about. And they're valuing themselves at one million, two million, you know, and trying to, you know, get two hundred thousand pound investment for five percent. How often do you see that in the real world? It happens quite a lot, and then you'll be amazed. Uh, um, actually, um, uh, if you go into uh, tech uh, startups, uh, it, that's actually the norm. It's quite normal to actually ask for even more than that uh, pre pre revenue, uh, and it's all based on financial forecasts. Uh, and that's where modeling comes into equation, and it's so important to be able to explain why you came up with that, because the money that you ask for as investment has to be linked and pretty much bulletproof linked with your projections. So you need that money to create that amount of conversion rate. You know, your cover conversion rates and uh, and uh, and and uh, and cost per acquisition and uh, and lifetime value are concepts that are very important at the pre revenue stage because it's the only way that you can explain why do you want the money. Because you, if you just tell them I want that money because I'm promising you mm, twenty times uh, ROI in uh, in five years. It's not good enough. Uh, it's it's not good enough because it's not uh, it's not the right uh, approach. You have to actually be able to say, I, with your money, I'm going to spend this money in advertising, which will create that conversion rate, and it's based on modeling that is done in previous businesses or in in, in previous similar business models or products that are like yours and that creates credibility and that's when somebody says yeah it makes sense i mean uh, now it, it makes sense why you want this money and what you do with it or i need to create an extra uh, how many features you need to create and expand the product in order to create more retention because everyone is focusing on conversion rate but no one it really explains on financial forecasts retention rate which is as important as conversion rate uh, because it's not good enough just to get new clients or customers. You need to retain them after that in order to have a, um, an ongoing, uh, a clear business model. And uh, it, for me, it's very simple. Marketing and advertising costs are creating new clients. Uh, product development are retention because it's where you actually put more features and more customer service uh, solutions into your product to maintain what you got gained, not just uh, gaining new ones. So if you, if you crack the, the, the mix, the right balance in between the conversion and retention rates, then you can actually look very credible in front of, the, of investors. And what about a... How would an entrepreneur value their company? I'm going to use something which um, we've got a little bit of knowledge on um, between us. Um, I want to launch, and I'm not doing this, I've got to, got to point out, but I want to release a 0% beer. And I've had the beer contract made, it, contract made um, by a brewery for me. I've had one batch, I've sold out, I've turned over £20,000. You know, there's no patent on it, there's no IP. I'm then going to investors to expand and I want 
£250,000 for argument's sake. For me personally, I don't understand why an investor would make that sort of investment. And, and I say it's because these investments are being made on crowdfunding platforms because an investor with the suitable wealth could actually just get his team to set that brewery up uh, or whatever they're doing immediately. Next week they could be operational. So what advice would you give on, on, on valuing a business which has no IP or, or, or patent when they're starting up? Is there sort of any sort of general multiple of their turnover they could be looking at or is it really dependent on, on the industry? Well, it depends a lot on the, also on the product uh, um, itself. Uh, I mean, is it different? Uh, what can make it a success in the marketplace? Is it uh, uh, more successful than other uh, uh, beers out there? It, it, does it bring an added value to the consumer that will choose it uh, against others? But at the same time, I'm, uh, I'm coming back to the, to the idea of uh, planning properly your projections. If you sold 20,000 without anybody investing and anybody are getting involved, how did you create those 20,000? Was it based on walking into uh, five pubs uh, around your house and selling them the beer? Was it because you had the proper plan behind and if you go for 250,000 investments, the first question would be, what are you going to do with the money? What is it for? If it's not for a unique product and it's not for creating maybe your own brewery so you can actually build it, it has to be for market expansion. And if it's for market expansion, it's what does that mean? What, what, where, what are you targeting? Where are you targeting? How are you doing it? All those are, uh, the more you work on it, the more credible your your valuation can look like because it's about what are you doing with my money in order for me to give you the money <laughs> that's as simple as it is in the in the eye of an investor there are two very simple things are you do i like you that's first um do i um can i trust you that's second and and third are you looking credible enough to actually uh, uh be investable uh, th those are the three questions and those three questions normally happen in the first 30 seconds uh, when, when you meet someone uh, so uh, the likeness and the trustiness it can be gained by having the right um, um, credibility on your offering and you're right if you are asking for money and you don't know why you're asking for that money or how did you come to that sum why is it 250,000 why is not 500 why is not a million why is not uh, 50,000 what makes the sum be the sum and that's why I'm coming back to your uh, financial projection and and understanding your market very well and if you can trans transmit that to investors uh, they will invest in you yeah. you just have to transmit all that information that you might have spent months and months on looking at the market and finding why how who and i and not any product that you, not all products have to have ip or, or 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 trademarks or in order to be investable because they can be just the fact that you are a credible business person that can make it a success because again i'm coming back to what makes a business a business first is the 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 team the people are making the business so if the investor can believe that you are trustworthy and you are credible to get their investment uh, a return on investment uh with your idea they will invest in you yeah and that's as simple as it is you know uh but for that you need to work a lot before you sit in front of investors so the majority of businesses that are are failing is because when they start talking to investors they are not ready because they don't even know what their plan is and and i've seen it so many times you know it's like uh, what are you going to do with the money i give you the money today what are you going to do tomorrow what's your first thing is there a common theme in the errors that they're that they're making uh y y depending on the size and depending on but uh, but i, I would tell you that uh, the, the the biggest uh, the biggest error in any organization that i've been to and it doesn't matter the size uh, is uh, uh, 
poor communication between all uh, parts of the business. Um, um, you'll be amazed, but I've been in multinationals that uh, were turning over uh, uh, billions and they still didn't have uh, the right uh, communication between all parties. So each country was doing their own thing. Uh, each uh, each uh, division was doing their own thing. They were communicating between each other very, very, um, in a very uh, scattered approach. So, so, and even then, even when you do have the 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 let's say the IT infrastructure or the the technical the technical uh, know how behind, you still are failing because your communication it's not flowing because of politics. Uh, the bigger you get, the more politics you have, and and politics are made by people. And again, I'm coming back to the the, the team and the people. The people that are, are uh, uh, managing the business are the, the people that have to communicate like if it was just one person. And that's if you, if you crack on communication skills, you have a very successful business. And that is the, the big difference. And every time that I look at operational uh, excellence, uh, the, the, where everything f- uh, flops is when they have to actually communicate between each other and down the uh, upstream, downstream, side stream, it doesn't matter which way. Uh, it's always related to somebody didn't tell somebody else at the right time, the right thing, the right approach, and then everything went wrong. So, so, so uh, um, for me, doesn't matter the size, small, medium, big communication tools are the most important thing that you can invest on as a business. And just a couple more questions um, for you. One thing that I find, you you have founders, then you start growing the business. The the first question to this is, obviously it would be dependent on on, on the business itself, but would you generally be looking to hire a a salesperson or a marketing guy? At what juncture would you be looking to hire a financial director to really look deep into your, your your business. I guess that's a little bit further down the line. But is it better to perhaps go on the sales or the marketing side um, initially? Uh, actually, um, ideally, when you are forming your um, founders team or uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, like the, the the first executive team, uh, you do need. Ideally, one of one of you should have uh, financial uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, I'm not saying that they have to be an accountant because it's not anymore uh, uh, a must that a finance director should be an accountant. Uh, it's very old school uh, business. Uh, business uh, 50 years ago, it was a must. Uh, today, it doesn't really matter. But what I would say is um, you do need at least one to be very knowledgeable about manage, managing the uh, financial management generally. Ideally, all the funders should be at least uh, financially um, um, knowledgeable in one way or form. Uh, but one should be the, the, the go-to in the, in the business between them as a group to say, uh, uh, to, to, to at least to be the one that can talk uh, the same language as uh, the, the the accountants and the tax uh, and the advisors and the legal advisors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so ideally you should have one uh, in the team uh, before you even start, because it's very important to have somebody. Um, but if you don't, um, actually you do need it uh, the sooner the better, because um, if you get investment, especially if you get investment, you need somebody to be there. And if you don't have it, the investors will be the first ones to actually ask for it and say, you want my money? You, uh, who is going to manage that? And, and that has to be there uh, very clear. So it's not, comp- it's not uh, saying it's sales or marketing more important than finance. No, both are equally important from the very beginning. Plus, you wouldn't be able to do any sales and marketing if you didn't even, if you if you didn't know uh, uh, how that that translates into your financial performance. And in terms of of, of companies that that are a startup company that are beginning to hire staff, is it a, a false economy to hire someone who is less experienced or maybe younger, um, uh, perhaps in marketing or in in social media? as opposed to someone's actually got that experience in that knowledge. They may cost, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 pounds a year or more. Is it best to wait till you can afford to hire that more senior person 
Or is it uh, just get in there and get someone who's straight out of university and has got a, a marketing or social media degree? What would your, your advice be? Um, it's a chicken and egg situation because you are always saying, uh, uh, can my business activity um, cover for the cost of labor that I need uh, at a specific time? And now, I would say that you should actually, any business leader should actually have uh, uh, the marketing knowledge that they need to have for the product. And this is start coming back to the beginning when you are building your marketing plan and your business plan and your and your route to markets and your business market analysis, competitive analysis, all those documents that you created originally to actually make create a, a, a proposition uh, you actually need to go back into them and update them on a daily to day basis and keep abreast of what's happening in your own market. If not, you cannot run your business effectively. So you, you need to be the first sales director, the first marketing director of the business anyway. Now, if you are not very um, um, comfortable with uh, uh, the new uh, uh, online uh, ways of uh, doing social media it's uh, only 10 years old so uh, so if you maybe are a, a bit older uh, uh, you might struggle to, to cope with that you can always get social media um, um, marketeers uh, without uh, uh, having to worry about the marketing strategy and the higher um, um, decision-making way of thinking that you need at the senior level. Uh, so you can go both ways, you know, but it's all about down to, I come back to knowing your strengths and your weaknesses and knowing uh, what you are good at and what you are not good at. If you're not good at that and you don't like it and you don't want to do it, you'll have to spend the money to get somebody to do it. <laughs> That's as simple as, uh, as it goes. Uh, but I, uh, I would say that if you don't have it at high level, you need strategic advice. And maybe as a startup, the, the way that you can um, um, avoid uh, a high cost at the very early stage that is not guaranteeing results and it's act, but it's actually hitting your uh, your profit and loss from day one because you have to pay wages no matter what. Maybe you should actually get the strategic advisor that is a marketing executive uh, heavyweight in your industry to help you on the side, almost like a mentor for you because you are the business owner and you need to know your market. And this is something that you should spend some time on yourself learning how to do things that are make sense in the marketing world. So if you don't have the skills, learn the skills. So my advice is get somebody to advise you as a mentor, even if it's uh, um, two days a month or whatever it is to actually take you through the strategic thinking of what, how you should think uh, uh, regarding your marketing strategy, regarding your sales strategy. And that will actually add more value to you and your business in the long run because it makes you become more aware of what you should do and how you should do it. And leave the nitty gritty to the, to the juniors because that's why, that's why the business should uh, uh, work as don't spend 100 grand on somebody to post on Facebook or LinkedIn. It doesn't make sense. You know, if you, and sometimes when you are a startup, you can't uh, afford having uh, a high level uh, executive as, as, as well as a, a junior one. You know, you can't pay both. So you need the nitty gritty. Don't do it yourself because it's a waste of money as well for, for the business because your time is more value, valuable elsewhere. Take a, take a junior to do all the nitty gritty. But learn the, the high level strategy if you don't know it yourself, learn it from somebody else as, as a part time advisor. The beauty of that is that it's not, it's not a cost that hits your PL on, uh, on, on an ongoing basis. It's when you need it. So, so you can play with that. And, and finally, just to, um, just to wrap up, Narcissus, um, you've been established for a while now. You've got um, good revenues coming in, You're in, in well into the, in, into the millions. When is the right time for the founder to actually take a step back and employ a senior level executive to take on certain elements of the role which they, they can't do, leaving them to almost become fulfilled chairman uh, role and overseeing the, the company and thinking about strategy? 
I think this is uh, something that cannot be put in a box. It depends a lot on the uh, sector. It depends a lot on the on the product uh, and, the, and the business idea. It also depends a lot on your personal circumstances. I mean, if you look at uh, um, Elon Musk, uh, uh, he's still an executive uh, uh, Tesla, uh, even if they are in billions. Uh, same with uh, um, um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, so. Uh, it's it's also a personal choice. Uh, you could keep running the business if you want that, and if that is that is the 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 lifestyle that you look for you for yourself. I say I would say that um, it's a mixture of what the market wants, where the business is, what do you want in, in uh, as a, as a founder, but also uh, what your investors want or shareholders in that case, uh, because you could you could have investment. Uh, you go through different rounds of investments, and you do have to answer your shareholders. And you get to a point where what you personally want might not be what they want, and then you have to draw a line and say where we are and is this still the relevant thing for me or is this uh, not relevant anymore and then I should uh, take a step back as you say or not but that is a personal uh, mix more than anything between all these elements that you can't put a formula you know to say okay if you hit uh, x amount of revenue then you should uh, you should uh, uh, step back from executive work no because each person is different and each uh, i come back to the origins what drives you and what is your uh, wh why do you want to do this in the first place if uh, if it's like jeff bezos to rule the world uh, then you'll never give it away um i don't know uh, it, it depends on each individual uh, yeah. but i think you have to think of all these aspects that are different elements in your business that influences you it's you personally but it's also your shareholders your investors your market your consumers your um your um, your stakeholders in general and, uh, and and your family you can't forget your family on all this i think that the thing really know about having you know you can't have expertise in in everything so you know you get to a certain stage actually you do need a a high level marketing executive a, a sales director a financial director who, who just has is their sole career more inherent knowledge than than you have and really sort of the right time to to um, bring them into your company to aid the, the actual growth and free up your time uh, for, for, for for thinking even actually just to think about where the company's gonna go new ideas and even for, for sort of networking um, that's sort of my um, my thought process no definitely definitely and also to sometimes you know I always say you need to know when to say how much is enough you know, uh, and that's something, but that's personal, and that's something that I think uh, it's, uh, other people don't think that way. So that's why I'm saying it's a it's a mix of everything. Uh, I, I I give you an example. I was working with uh, this uh, Italian manufacturer many years ago that they were uh, supplying uh, 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 own label product to Tesco. So you can imagine the size and the, and the scope. Uh, and it was a family-run business, four generations, and uh, and they ended up to uh, it's it's an example of the actually you can get there but i have examples on the other side as well uh, uh normally family businesses are the most reluctant ones to 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 give away the control of the of the of running the business um at this in this case they actually contracted the ceo and everybody stepped back from the uh, running the business because they realized that they were actually hindering the growth because they couldn't grow faster enough because because they were not the right person, people to do that uh, for many reasons. And they got somebody from the industry that was, uh, that came from a business that was five times bigger than theirs. And it was like, and, and, and he was, he was the one to take them on that journey to become bigger. So it happens. Sometimes it happens and it's for, but it's all about the reasons related to the personal circumstances uh, of, uh, of the group of, uh, of individuals that, uh, that have to decide that. Yeah. Narcissus, that's been absolutely uh, a fantastic chatting to you. I could actually probably chat all day um, with you. I have so many questions, but um, we do have to, to finish up there and hopefully we have an opportunity to, 
to chat again in the in, in, in the future. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to put down your um, your LinkedIn details um, within this um, post and on the screen right now for people to know if they want to to, to find you. You do offer a, a consultancy service, and I think that people have got a lot from this and a, a deeper understanding. Uh, Nazis, thank you very much indeed.